This panel is brought to you by Only Human, our friends at Only Human, as part of their month-long commitment to elevating and centering trans voices. And so really, we wanted to take a moment, take an hour, which hopefully will be a little teaser for you to want to keep doing more of this work in your lives. How to talk about trans voices of color and what would it mean to have a movement, a trans movement that is actively anti-racist. I'm Tristan Reese. I live in Portland, Oregon. I run a consulting firm that that specifically does LGBTQ plus and uh, inclusion work. Hi, I'm Devin Norell. I am a model, I, a lot of bit of a writer as of lately, and I'm also an advocate for the community. Uh, hi, my name is Yari Jones. I am a model, actress, producer, activist. A lot of my work centers around inclusion of trans people, of black people, and fat folks. Hi, I'm Sami Figaredo. Uh, I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. I am an actor, an activist. I work as a um, transgender, gender non-conforming, and non-binary inclusivity trainer at the Ackerman Institute's Gender and Family Project here in New York. What is happening in the world that feels great to you? How are people showing up in a way that is making you feel seen, heard, valued? So, you know, within my field of work, especially fashion, so many brands are reaching out to me now, right? And, you know, I have to make the conscious decision of, you know, are they reaching out because I can be their token Black trans girl? Or are they really trying to do the work, right? We are in a very interesting spot as, you know, as people of color, where because people are listening, <laughs> I'm going to say that in quotations, listening, um, we are able to, to move the message even even if these companies or these brands are trying to exploit us, right? Um, there's a power that we're holding at the moment, at least what I'm seeing within branding, um, whether it's fashion, whether it's skincare, you know, they start with, you know, we want to show support, right? So now I'm going to force you to do it. I'm going to force you to move forward with it and really hold you accountable to it. You know, I, I'm even putting in contracts where it's like, if you are not going to donate, if you're not showing receipts, I don't want my image you know, a part of your product at all. And, you know, because Yari Jones at the moment is a hot ticket, they, they, they have to choose. And it's either fall or, you know, get with the program. So I think so often it's trans people or people of color who are trying to navigate, you know, how we're going to move forward in these companies. So it's good to be on the other side for, for once. <laughs> I, for me, it's still day by day, like, um, I'll be continuing events, but also because my social media was completely saturated with death, that being um, uh, Black death and then being Black trans death, which is what Yari also just mentioned. There's a lot of people to witness or to know of to have died. One of the last articles that I, or one of the most recent articles that I wrote were six Black trans women were killed in a matter of nine days. And so it's, it's difficult to hear it. It's even more difficult to write it and I, my own editors have said to me, okay, we can't have you write this anymore because this is too much, you know? And then also feel sadness and disappointment in seeing allyship kind of only exist within that month of June and now everyone has forgotten what's happened. We're, you know, we're still trying to make changes. We're still trying to carry on a revolution, but it seems like everyone outside of the folks that are getting killed. Don't give it. Uh, one of my challenges has been to navigate like activist burnout. I do feel like it is my lane as an activist to take on certain emotional labor, especially as a light-skinned person of color. Um, I firmly believe that there are certain things I should be doing, and I do them. That is not the complaint. The complaint is the work is, unfortunately, this is the state of our world, is that the work is not done. And so making sure I can navigate that, have the energy to do that, and not avoid burnout for anyone else in my community who would need it. So we found the people who are really ready to do the work, great. But it also took realizing how many people among us were only willing to talk the talk. I don't think that's going to go away. I don't think that's going to change. I think it's a growing pain. We're going to see it a lot. We're going to see a lot of people who are unwilling to do the work. I think that this is a time where we decide what do we do when that happens. In these situations where organizations are like, okay, right, the wool has been lifted from our eyes. There is a problem. We need to do way better. We know 
that we need to have leaders of Colorado organization at the table, as some people say, what would an anti-racist response to someone bringing that very useful information, what would it look like? How can organizations truly transform, not at the surface level, but all the way down? In any organization, whether it be uh, the media industry, finance, why haven't Black people been hired in all of these decision making? If you want a company that's going to reflect what you're stating, we believe in Black lives, then your board, not just your board, but the people that are running the business outside of the board need to look and be the same people that you're claiming to represent, to, to protect, et cetera. And that's not, I feel like rarely the case. You, you gotta, if you're going to talk and talk, you got to walk the walk. So yeah, great. You have policies. Wonderful. We're all inclusive now. Meanwhile, this guy just called the N-word at the, at the end of my cubicle and y'all just like, oh, it's no big deal. <laughs> you know, like you need to be able to heavily enforce it. If anything, this person calls me an N-word, that person needs to go. And then you can claim Black Lives Matter on your Instagram, on your Facebook or whatever black dot that should, that should represent BLM for that day or two on your social media and or in your uh, official press releases and et cetera. Yes, like Black people are not being hired to be in positions of power. But then when we are, we are still at the bottom of the totem pole when we're there. So, you know, there are a lot of Black folks in the rooms, right? There are a lot of Black folks at the table, you know, they have a seat, but none of their ideas are being taken seriously. They're not being listened to. So I, I think what's interesting is, is actually being able to to give up power in a very large way, you know, when history allows or when, you know, companies allow um, Black folk to take the lead or to even, you know, be, you know, heavily considered um, with ideas like that, it shows that it works. There are hundreds of companies, successful companies um, that, you know, hire Black people and, you know, actually move forward, you know, and become more progressive in what you're seeing. We are all, because we grew up in a white supremacist country, and these ideas are ingrained in us. And we have to unlearn them. We all do. Like in the same way that we have to unlearn issues of misogyny, issues of homophobia, transphobia. I would love to see people, if they're going to profess true allyship, give something up. Along with these policy changes, along with personal changes, there needs to be a culture shift that acknowledges you know, it's not about like making the diversity higher. This person is not a diversity hire just because they're a person of color now at your organization. You just finally are aware that there are black and brown people out there who are equally, if not more qualified to do this job that you haven't been allowing them to do before. That doesn't make them the diversity hire. This is just the first time you've actually hired diversity. It, it requires actual action. Like it, you can't just say it and you don't get to declare yourself an ally unless you've actually done something to ally, ally yourself with the community you're trying to serve. You hire folks of color and they come into a deeply white supremacist culture, they're not going to thrive. And then people are gonna be like, well, see, we tried and it didn't work. And it's like, well, mm. no fool. It's because the systems that they walked into had everything already stacked against them. So of course they're not gonna be able to, to survive and thrive. So of course it's accountability as Devin Norell spoke to, um, and of course it's action as, as Sammy and Yari spoke to, and it's also about taking a really close look at your culture and are people really ready to take the leadership of folks of color and step back, um, as I think everyone said, and, uh, and really learn and be led, even if it feels a little different than it has for you in the past as an organization. How are you all sustaining yourselves right now? And what, are things that people can do that isn't that isn't presumptuous, presuming a relationship that isn't there, to step in, to take on some of the burden, uh, to help build in better community supports for those of you whose bodies are on the front lines. I think for most Black people, like this, we're just eternally tired because we have to fight against racism every day, and so it's like, how can how can I help you pitch your so, you know, like living your entire life just trying to teach some new person every different day that this is racist and this is what racism looks like and this is systemic oppression and, and this is anti-blackness and this is that. Like we literally 
encounter so many different macro and microaggressions on a daily basis. So many different things that can be done, but off the top of my head, all of these things come down to just offering yourself up for service to the folks that have been fighting on the front lines, whether today or since they were two years old and can speak and say, this is racist. Let people lead you on how they can best be supported. Don't, don't swoop in and assume that you know. Don't swoop in and demand that they tell you right away. It might, they might eventually tell you, but it might take them a while to like gather their thoughts because they're, they're mentally exhausted. The two most important things that have, ever, you know, that have helped me are like deciding what my capacity is right now uh, and then enforcing boundaries. And it's like an internalized belief in me as well that like I just kind of need to get over the reluctance I have with simply saying like, so uh, training is my job. Here is my rate for what you want. And when you're ready to pay it, just like come on over. But I can't keep doing it for free. Because at a certain point, I need to take that off. Because simply doing that labor for somebody and even the educating, while I see the value in it, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it, it's tiring. What I've realized about it and, you know, you know, again, whether it's positive or negative, is like people want to consume. They want to suck in as much of you as possible to one, feel some sort of empathy or two, to figure out, you know, what it means to them um, or what your, what your liberation means to them. So I, I get a lot of messages online where, you know, especially, you know, right after the death of George Floyd, um, and then the two black trans women where I'm getting these long messages from like, you know, people who I consider allies that are just, you know, trying to pull everything out of me to, you know, to either congratulate them on, you know, awakening <laughs> or trying to see how they can help me or, you know, aid me, but doing it in a way that they need to, to pull from me, right? instead of just being like, hey, what do you need? How can I support you? But I really have to like take a moment back because it's so constant um, now. And, um, and you know, they assume that, you know, you're, you're probably talking about this all the time. So why not with me, right? Um, finding time to just, you know, have mindless thinking and, you know, to be able to just be around supportive people and to make those um, demands or those boundaries clear, you know, even with my own family or even with my own circle, you know, like today we're not talking about this, you know, so because it's, it's draining, you know, it's draining because it's constant. People are going to make it more constant, even when you're trying to shut it out. Um, trying. <laughs> Just trying. Um, Sammy, Devin, Norell, Yari, you're all incredible, amazing. Thank you so, so, so much for being with us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all so much for making this happen.